from the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs. This is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. This is Locked On Chiefs, and we have a huge day for you. We have the finale of the AFC West crossover show for you, and Chris and I are going to get into the offensive line group. Who's under contract? Who is not? Chris is from Chiefs Digest. I am from RGR Football on YouTube, as well as Rogue Analytics. That We will put out our draft guide. We will have all kinds of information for you leading up to the draft about production, athleticism, etc. That's going to be a huge part of this offseason, but we have to start with who's under contract where. When we look at the offensive line group, this is a group that was much maligned, but I think came through in the end on that Super Bowl run, and I wonder just how much intact they're going to be able to stay. Man, that's a big question because they're looking at the group right now. Eric Fisher, LDT, Cam Irving, Austin Reader, Steven, Steven Wisniewski. Oh, sorry, Wisniewski is not. Allegretti, Sanat, Jackson Barton, Ryan Hunter, and Martinez Rankin are who is on your team for next year at this point. And, uh, and well, yes, and Mitch Schwartz. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, big question mark, though. Does Cam Irving get his option picked up? Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. He's on a team option. We will know by March 17th. The team has to pick it up by then. I don't then know. you start talking about Wiz- Let me, Go ahead. Before we get to Wisniewski, what's your gut feeling tell you about Irving? Uh, I, I really don't know. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I think that that could be a cap savings. Uh, but I could say the same about Austin Ryder and LDT as well. So... Hard for me to know where they're going to go in that regard. I think that, I think honestly, Martinez Rankin is going to be a starter for Kansas City next year, and I'm not sure if it's going to be a left guard or right guard, but I do think he'll, he's going to be a starter next year. Um, and I think they like that. Me. I think it's about how he comes back from his knee. Uh, I think there is a slight possibility he might not be ready, just because we don't know how he recovers. But that's true. That guard group that you just never know. I I'm. As much as I like Wiz, I can't see them making him a starter for the season. I could see him returning on a, a deal similar to what he just played under, which was, what, 900 k uh, for a seasoned yep. veteran to, again, come in in relief, not to be your everyday starter. But that's about the only way I can see it. Well, and then you have Andrew Wiley, who started part of the season and played really well in 2018, didn't play nearly as well in 2019, uh, and got benched at the very end of the year. And, and you know, if you really want to be, uh, if you really want to be clear on that, to me, I felt a little sorry for Wiley at the end of the year because he didn't even get a dress. And I get it because of numbers, but at the same time, uh, when you don't fill the holes that they need to fill, and and you can only go so with so many players, so I get it. Uh, I really hate the forty six man rule in the NFL. I do too. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see that abolished. To tell you the truth, but. I, I just too. don't know what to take of those sit downs for Wiley and whether the team has gotten to the point where they feel they need to move on or whether that was just a positional thing because Wiz was there. Um, I do feel that Wiz played better um, down the stretch. Uh, and maybe that's just a, the veteran knack. I don't know. I, it's hard to tell how they feel about Wiley in terms of can he continue his progression? That's what we have to see, especially with, with a couple of younger guys like Rankin um, and Allegretti there. You could even see them be be adding to this group. I kind of feel like that's a, a, a fairly large possibility because I'm not sure how they feel about anybody on their interior except for the, the the tackles. I think nobody else is truly safe. This is a big year for Laurent Duvernay Tardif. I don't know that he played up to par with how they feel as well, but this is a group that they really well, like I, together. Do you think he stays? I can't imagine he's back. Okay, not so on his numbers and. Okay. Yeah, and honestly, Austin Ryder saved his best games for the for the Super Bowl and for the playoffs. He did not play well most of the rest of the season, so you have to wonder if they're going to be looking at upgrading that, uh, especially with where they're going to be drafting at 32. I would think that an interior offensive lineman is going to be somebody that's going to be available and is going to be dropping down boards because of all the other positional groups. So I think you could get value there at 32. Yeah, and if you guys need a name, Cushenberry from uh... – LSU is a name to look at. I kind of like the way he plays, but it could be definitely an option, especially if they can't trade out of that pick. We're going to talk draft trades and all that as we come up to it, folks. Not a worry, but uh, for the most part, I do feel there'll be a little bit of movement, um, obviously on the on the older side of it, but anything in Barton Hunter's Sonat that you, that you think is is 
a possibility to start, or is it either the five starters plus Irving or somebody new? Yeah, I honestly I don't know enough about Sonat Barton or Hunter. I, Hunter played horribly in the preseason, so I'm surprised he's even on the roster. Barton and Sonat really never got a chance to play, so going to have to see what they have in, in training camp. They'll be back for that, uh, and, and we'll see from there. I, I agree with you, and I'm interested to see how it falls out. But for now, when we come back, folks, we're going to get into the last of the AFC West. A little bit of run around, and uh, I try to be nice, at least most of the time. So check out this AFC West, the ultimate crossover. And don't forget, we have a double episode for you coming early next week with Seth Kaiser of The Athletic. Hope you guys enjoy that as well. What's up, everybody? Happy Friday from all of us over here in the Locked On AFC West Ultimate Division crossover. This week, you've heard from the Charters, the Raiders, the Chiefs, and the Broncos. We've been discussing each team's outlook from the 2019 season all the way through the 2020 season. Now, today, we're taking a look at the broad spectrum of where these teams are going to be at. And it's Valentine's Day, and we just want to say that we love you guys. Uh, but we're going to analyze uh, the AFC. The Broncos are going to face a new division, the AFC East. We're going to talk about those opponents. And then we also going to talk about the fact that the Broncos, the Chiefs, the Chargers, and the Raiders are going to be facing the NFC South as well. We're going to talk about how they might stack up against those teams. And because it's Valentine's Day, we're going to tell you guys who our Broncos, Chiefs, Chargers, Raiders, Valentine's player is, who do we love in our organization and why. All in today's jam-packed episode of our Ultimate Division Crossover. I'm your York host of Lockdown Broncos. Joined today alongside Ryan Tracy, host of the Lockdown Chiefs podcast, alongside Dan of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, and as always, your boy Q, host of the Locked On Raiders podcast. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm very excited. Obviously, fellas, happy Valentine's Day for you. Uh, make sure you guys take out your ladies tonight, your wives, your girlfriends, and uh, let's figure out what we're going to be diving into here today. And uh, look, I think the news, it's its simple. Uh, the AFC West is going to be taking on the AFC East this year, which includes the Buffalo Bills, the New England Patriots, alongside the Miami Dolphins and the New York Jets. So uh, a string of uh, an interesting division, to say the least, obviously, with a lot of change going. And uh, Ryan, let's kick things off with you in terms of the Chiefs against the AFC East. How do you think they might stack up against these four teams? You know, it's really interesting. And when I look at overall, and I know we're going to talk about uh, the NFC South here in a little bit, and that that's still a question mark with the Drew Brees situation. But the Tom Brady situation is almost the same thing in New England. And for me, that leads me to believe that the, the biggest opponent that they have to worry about is the Buffalo Bills in terms of the AFC East. And that's just my perception. What do you guys think of the Bills and the whole uh, division itself? Um, I'll start things off here. I think the Buffalo Bills made tremendous strides from, I believe, Sean McDermott's second season all the way to now. I mean, when Josh Allen was a rookie last year, uh, you know, I think that there were some hits and some misses, but he looked like a better quarterback this year. He looked more comfortable. He had some weapons. Uh, obviously, you're talking about John Brown. He obviously had Cole Beasley as well, but the run game was something that led them away. Is too, And also, they had a pretty strong defense all across the board. Um, they were a competitive football team, and that heartbreaking loss they had uh, against the Houston team, Sections. I think that's something that's going to sit with them all offseason long. Um, they were they they should have won that game. They had multiple opportunities, um, and then they just snowballed it where they turned it over, and then they couldn't get things going. I think that they're going to be back for revenge. I think Buffalo right now, in my opinion, is the early favorite to win the AFC East. Uh, even if they have Tom Brady back in the division or not, they have a strong football team all across the board right now, and I think they're going to reload and, and maybe look to even improve some of those positions. I agree. I agree. I think the Buffalo Bills are the team to beat right now in the AFC East for every reason that Cody just pointed out. I also think that the Jets and Dolphins are going to be much improved in 2020, uh, especially the Dolphins. I don't know what the Jets are going to do. I just think that they're got to be better. Uh, they just, they, I just think that, you know, Sam Darnold won't have the same issues that he had to start off the season. So he'll be, uh, in the fold to begin things off and, and probably get off to a better start than they did in 2019. But I really believe in what Brian Flores is doing in Miami. I really, really do. I think he's going to uh, uh, be a really good head coach. And depending on how the draft shakes out for them, they have a lot of draft picks. I think they can really turn that roster around quick, fast, and in a hurry. They got some good pieces there already. And so I think that they, they're they going to be a much better team. But still, but Buffalo is going to be the team, in my opinion, that's going to be the team to beat. Uh, Josh Allen, I like what he's doing, especially with his legs, able to keep plays alive. I think that's very uh, critical for what the NFL is doing now. So, I look at the Buffalo Bills as a team to beat. I think the Patriots are going to kind of start to take their slide, even if they do have Tom Brady back in, in 2020. If they don't, if Jared Stidham's the guy in 2020, I'm really not too concerned about what they got going on. Still think they'll have a strong defense, but I think you'll start to see the Patriots start to slide off a little bit. So, uh, yeah, it should be, it should be tough. I'm expecting probably the Raiders to, to go, I don't know, maybe two and two, 
Maybe maybe three and one, but probably take an L to the Buffalo Bills in uh, in twenty twenty. No, oh, but they're beating the Patriots, huh? All right. Well, I like that. I think we can all agree that um, we we will take a queen sweep of the Patriots inside the division. I think we can all get on board of a you know AFC West sweep of the Patriots. That'd be cool. But I think it has to be Buffalo. Just two teams trending in totally opposite directions, even though it feels so weird to write off the Patriots, right? Just because it always seems like no matter what's going on over there, even after a down year, that they're just going to find some way to be competitive, find some way to go 11-5 and five next season, and find some way to beat the Buffalo Bills and be the better team still somehow, even though there's no way they shouldn't be. But I think this is a pretty you know up and down division for the AFC West to take on, because I think you have two teams that we don't really know a lot from right now with the Miami Dolphins, especially, you know, if they end up taking, if they end up taking Tua Tanga Vailoa in the draft and all of those things and the Jets just seem like a dumpster fire that you don't know which Jets team you're going to see from one week to another. So I think it's going to be a very interesting division to go up against this year. And I'm excited to watch it. I think the Chargers will probably end up going about two and two against the division if I had to call it in February right now. Well, even taking a look at the Miami Dolphins, Brian Flores entering year number two as the head coach. They did not seem very competitive uh, outside maybe a few games. And some people were starting to think, are they tanking on purpose? Ryan Fitzpatrick, obviously there, you know, just, they made a lot of changes. Even having Josh Rosen, they they completely, in my opinion, uh, they mishandled that situation. So for me, I feel as if the Miami Dolphins might make a little bit of a stride. Really, like you mentioned, depends on if they go with the Tua direction, his health, where they're holding up with that. Um, I think that would be an intriguing option. The New York Jets, I want to take a look at that as well. And uh, anything that's controlled by Adam Gase all turns to dust. And uh, I don't foresee them doing anything too big. They do have, I, like I said, I feel like Sam Darnold is an unfortunate benefactor of having to work with Adam Gase. Uh, he's just not a guy that's personable with his players in the locker room. Many Jets players feel that uh, they don't want to play for him, but they'll play for each other. So they're kind of keeping that glue together. But there's definitely some issues going on in that New York Jets locker room. And, you know, I think that uh, for those matches, really depending on where it's at. Um, taking a look at it, I mean, the Broncos are going to be on the road against uh, the New York Jets, and they're also going to be home against Miami Dolphins. I feel like they can beat this division. I, I feel like they can go 3-1. and one. Buffalo is the biggest question mark for me as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue on here on this beautiful Valentine's Day all across the Locked On NFL Network all week long, you guys have been locked into our AFC West Ultimate Division crossover, and we're going to get into the NFC South coming up in just a moment, how the AFC West maybe stacks up against them in 2020. But before we do that, I got to remind you guys, if you have a Google Home device or you have the Google Assistant app on your cellular devices, you guys need to go in, go to your settings, change your news source to the Locked On Podcast Network, and every morning when you Say, hey, Google, play me my news. You will receive Lockdown Broncos, Lockdown Chargers, Lockdown Chiefs, Lockdown Raiders in five minute and 60 second updates on the daily news with those respective teams. And you guys don't want to miss it. Stay locked on with your Google Assistant today. All right, gentlemen, jumping back into this here. When we take a look at the Broncos, the Raiders, the Chargers, and the Chiefs. Look, last time we recapped, they're going to be taking on the AFC West previously. Then they're going to be taking on an NFC team in another division, and that's going to be the NFC South, led by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Atlanta Falcons, the New Orleans Saints, and the Carolina Panthers. And this probably might be the toughest divisional matchups that I think that these teams will have to face this year. And really looking at Tampa Bay, where they were at with Bruce Arians, Shaquille Barrett, nine. Sacks. I mean, they have some issues and questions at quarterback like some of the teams in the division. Atlanta, they're going through a resurgence period trying to figure things out with Matt Ryan. Is he the guy for them going forward? New Orleans, is Drew Brees coming back? Is he not? And the Carolina undergoing a massive, massive rebuild. Uh, so I think this could open up some opportunities for some dialogue here. And Q, I'm going to have you start off here, my man. In terms of these teams, Tampa Bay, Atlanta, New Orleans, Carolina, which matchup do you feel like you're looking forward to the most from a Raiders perspective? Well, I'm, I'm interested to see personally what Carolina's going to do because like you mentioned they are going through a big rebuild Matt Rule to, goes over from Baylor goes over to Carolina as a first time NFL head coach he gets a lot of money he's taking a lot of assistant coaches over there with them and uh, you know that you start to see veterans already retire or be released Greg Olson's no longer there Luke Keekley is retired Cam Newton is he going to be back who knows that's a good question you know there's guys that are older in the tooth that all of a sudden aren't coming back for Carolina so are they going to continue to make this purge and, and go younger, younger, younger. And since Matt Rule has so many years on his contract, does he have that opportunity to, uh, you know, just go ahead with the whole youth movement and try to build that thing up, which is what he traditionally has done every place he's been, Temple, Baylor, and now the Carolina Panthers. So that's one very te- one team that I'm very interested to see. 
And then Tampa Bay, I want to know who the quarterback's going to be. I, I believe it's going to be Jameis Winston, but are you going to keep him on a one-year deal, basically franchise him and see if he can cut back on the turnovers that he had in 2019? Or do you go in another direction? I mean, Bruce Arians was brought in to get Jameis Winston right. Bruce Arians has been able to get every quarterback right that he's ever worked with. I mean, it doesn't matter what team he's played or he's been a coach of. Uh, that quarterback has been uh, really good. Carson Palmer in in, in, uh, in Arizona. Obviously, he had Peyton Manning in, uh, in in Indianapolis. He worked with Ben Roethlisberger in, in Pittsburgh. I mean, the dude knows what he's doing when it comes to quarterbacks. So could Jameis Winston be that guy? So those two teams right there are really intriguing to me. Also, those are two teams that I think that the Raiders should beat in 2020 just because they, there's, it's a big unknown about them. Uh, the Saints are always going to be a tough team regardless who the quarterback is. I, I think it'll probably be Drew Brees, but if he's not back, will it be Teddy Bridgewater? Will it be Taysom Hill? Who's going to be the guy? And then Atlanta, I just I never know what to expect from the Falcons. One year to the next. I don't know if they're going to be good, bad, ugly, what. I just don't know. So Tampa Bay and Carolina, I'm most intrigued by. I think the Raiders could win those. Uh, New Orleans, I want to see who the quarterback's going to be, but I expect them to be good. And Atlanta, I just got a big question mark when it comes to them. Yeah, I think that's what makes Atlanta the wild card in this division, right? You just don't know what they're going to do. And I think it reminds me a lot of the Chargers. You know, it's like, is this the year that Atlanta finally puts it together? And they did for the 28 to three Super Bowl game year. But that was with, I mean, Kyle Shanahan as well. And we've, you know, saw what happened with that in the Super Bowl. But I think with Atlanta, what team are you going to get when those two teams square up? Because they, you know, they have Matt Ryan. We're not sure what's going on with that situation. Dan Quinn seems to be coming back for another season, which is super surprising. But I think that is the wild card in this division. And the team that when you go up against them, you're not sure which one it's going to be. And with the Saints, it will be very interesting to see if they can have it play out like they want to, or at least what it's been reported, have Drew Brees go for this season and have Taysom Hill, you know, stay under him for one more year and see what he can turn into the year after that. But even if that's the case, do we start seeing more of Taysom Hill? Is it more of a 70-30 split between those two guys? Those are the questions that I have specifically about the NFC South, because I think it's going to be an exciting division and a very weird division. Well, I think the biggest thing, gentlemen, when I look at it, the biggest wild card, I, I'm looking to see what this Carolina Panthers team does. Are they going to keep Cam Newton around? Obviously, he didn't play at all in 2019, dealing with a lot of injuries for him. Uh, I, the biggest question, if they're undergoing this rebuild, if he's going to get a seven-year contract, Matt Rule, and obviously David Tepper really just cleaning house, Greg Olson, now a Fox analyst, and he's going to be covering the XFL, which has been very fun to watch so far for the first weekend. Um, but take a look at the Panthers. In, anytime you undergo a massive rebuild, and a seven-year contract pretty much indicates that, look, we're going to give you at least three to four years to be able to get this right. And then after that, we'll see where we are at. Uh, do they keep Christian McCaffrey around? That's a big question. I mean, he was a guy that destroyed people in fantasy football. And in my honest opinion, I felt like he should have been the offensive player of the year. But uh, he got sorely overlooked. I mean, he was a guy that had over 1,000 yards rushing and uh, over 1,000 yards receiving. For the AFC West, he is going to be the probably key guy in those matchups that I think this team, that the teams look to game plan around and try to figure out out um, that to me is going to be one of the biggest angles for there and as you guys mentioned with New Orleans not knowing what Drew Brees is going to do you know there's been reports by Jay Glazier that Taysom Hill is expected to be the franchise quarterback of the future for them that's how the Saints view him I still find that really hard to believe considering that we saw Teddy Bridgewater play really well when Drew Brees was out with his injury Atlanta I mean Julio Jones Matt Ryan I mean Matt Ryan just got paid big buku bucks but all of a sudden you know they're just not getting things going Dan Quinn there were some rumors he was going to be fired they actually bring him back for 2020 20. Um, I think this is going to be uh, some coverage matchups, taking a look at Julio Jones and obviously Michael Thomas for the Saints and Tampa Bay, you know, look at them, Mike Evans as well, Chris Godwin. I mean, they have a lot of options all across the board that I think are going to uh, pose some really coverage uh, threats to the Broncos, their Chargers, the Raiders and the Chiefs. So, ladies and gentlemen, wrapping up the NFC South side of things here on today's episode of our Ultimate AFC West Division crossover. I'm Cody Work, host of Lockdown Broncos. Dan Wade, host of Lockdown Chargers, your boy Q of Lockdown Raiders. We've been talking about the AFC East, the NFC South. But coming up here in just a moment, we're going to transition to a little bit of a different note. We're going to be talking about the players that we love. It is Valentine's Day, and obviously, uh, we want you guys to stay locked in. So, don't forget to subscribe to Lockdown Broncos, Lockdown Chiefs, Lockdown Chargers, and Lockdown Raiders on your favorite podcast providers. Okay, gentlemen, jumping into a fun segment here on Locked On AFC West Ultimate Division Crossover. Uh, it's Valentine's Day. So for all of us, we're going to be taking a 
in-depth look all across the board on our respective teams for players that we love. And this could be a current player. It could be a, a star player of the past. It could be a backup player um, who has a very big role. Um, and then we can maybe little analyze a little bit about maybe what it would look like if one of those teams were somewhere else. And so taking a look at things first, Ryan Tracy had to dip out of here. But Ryan mentioned his Valentine for the Chiefs side of things would be Patrick Mahomes and Anthony Sherman. He says, make fullbacks great again. I'm a big believer in the fullback position, Andy Janovich. Uh, John Gruden and, and Q, obviously, you know a little bit, too, about the fullback position, uh, the Chargers, and obviously uh, one of the Watt brothers there at the fullback position. Uh, so the fullback position is super important. Worthy of a Valentine's Day consideration? I'd, I'd maybe say so, but I don't want to take the cake here. Q, I want to start things off with you. If you had to look at it from a Raiders standpoint, who would be your Valentine? Who is it that you love? Well, I mean, it's got to be Josh Jacobs. It's got to be the young man that should have won Offensive Rookie of the Year, but he didn't. Uh, Kyler Murray ended up getting that award, but that's another conversation for another day. Josh Jacobs came in and proved that he could be a, a starter in the league and he could be that every down back for the Raiders and really just took over the league. He's a tough dude, uh, played with a separate shoulder from like week seven uh, on. I mean, he, he played for weeks on top of weeks with a, a separated shoulder. Matter of fact, it might have been for seven weeks. So he was, I don't know. Anyway, it was a long time that he was playing with this shoulder injury and just uh, kept going out there week in and week out and playing and performing at a very high level. So Josh Jacobs has got to be my guy. I'm expected to see him, his role expand in 2020. Uh, he did a lot of carrying the ball, but he didn't get a lot of receiving the ball out of the backfield. I'm expecting that part of his game to be implemented into the game plan moving forward for John Gruden and company. I just think that's another weapon that he is able to do. He's, he's not a one trick pony. He's able to catch the ball out of the backfield. He's able to block really well. I mean, he, he was at Alabama and he did some good things and he wasn't even the starter. So now he's going to have to expand his game and, and just improve on on what he did in his rookie year, and now all of a sudden take it to the next level. So I, I mean, when I look at as someone that that I'm going to love and, and and give a Valentine's love to or shout out to, it's got to be Josh Jacobs, just because everything he was able to do his rookie year and everything I expect him to do moving forward for the Raiders for years to come. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love Josh Jacobs too. I mean, he can come to the Chargers anytime. You have to love the way he plays. I mean, he just has a fun style to him, the way he finishes off runs and the way he seems to be like a smaller guy that can either you know, lower his shoulder on you or get around you one way or the other. I like that pick a lot. For the Chargers, I'm also going to go with a current player and I'm also going to go with a young player and that is Derwin James because when you think about the Chargers, I mean, the Chargers mascot is what? Electricity? I mean, electricity defines Derwin James because that's just the way he plays it's not just the stats that he's put up even though he has put up dominant stats when he's been on the field but it's just the energy that he brings and going into last season when he was a rookie there was a soundbite that came out from Melvin Ingram who has been one of the vocal leaders on this team he basically said hey Derwin James can say he's a leader and everything else, but that's not for him to decide. I mean, he has to earn the respect from his teammates to be a local leader or to be a vocal leader. You have to earn that respect from your teammates. And I think in this short time, in a season in five games that Derwin James has been on the Chargers, he's had that effect on not only the other Chargers players, but the fan base. I mean, he's a fan favorite. He does everything well. He rushes the passer. He's great in coverage. He is so good at tackling for the Chargers. I mean, that has been such a sore spot from them. He's a guy that can get downhill in a hurry and make a big hit that is going to energize the crowd and energize a fan base. He's just such an exciting player. The one thing I'd like to see the Chargers do more with him is blitz him more because in his first season, we saw that very effective, especially against a guy like Patrick Mahomes. You know, if you're worried about having contain on Patrick Mahomes, then sending a guy like Derwin James, who he's not going to be able to get around, is something that has worked very effectively. So my Valentine's Day, the love from me has to go to Derwin James because it's not just the fact that he's already one of the best safeties in the NFL. It's just the way he plays and the type of energy and leadership that he brings to the Chargers. I, I certainly agree with that, and, and I'll dive a little bit deeper on that here in a little bit. But uh, in terms of the Broncos, when I take a look at it, somebody that I love that I think is so valuable to this football team is Von Miller. And every year he's subject to trade rumors that are created by these false media accounts being spread out there. Uh, but Von Miller has been the most valuable player in this Broncos franchise um, dating back. I would say if you take a look at value, I would rank obviously Peyton Manning coming in as being one of those big value ones. But Von Miller has become 
that type of value to the Broncos, what Peyton Manning used to be for the Colts and what he was for the Broncos when he was there in his stint. Von Miller is a guy that, uh, in my opinion, can change the game at any point in time. He's elusive. He's strong. He's versatile. He's sneaky. He can dip his shoulder and get around you very quickly. And uh, he's got a lot of respect from a lot of tackles, opposing tackles and offensive coordinators all across the National Football League. He'd be one that I would select as my Bronco that I love and that I adore as a Broncos player and the value he brings to the football team. But gentlemen, I want to switch things up here for a second. Uh, now I'm going to switch the cards for you. If you had to choose, if you had to pinpoint a player on another team within the division that you admire, that would be a Valentine you from the other team, who would it be? And Q, I'm going to put you on the spot first, my friend. And then Daniel, I'm going to put you on the spot from the, another team in the AFC West. Who would be a Valentine that you select? Well, I think the easy answer for everybody would be Patrick Mahomes. I mean, I really think that that's the easiest answer just because of everything that he brings to the table and, and the way that he's, uh, you know, been an MVP in the league. He's been a Super Bowl MVP. He's only been a starter two years in the league. I think that's the easy answer. So I'm not going to go with that one. I'm going to stick with the Kansas City Chiefs though. And I'm going to say McCole Hardman. And I like him because he was the guy who was selected when the Chiefs thought that they were about to lose Tyreek Hill. When he got into all kind of off the field issues, thought that they were going to lose him, thought he was going to be suspended. So basically they drafted him to replace Tyreek Hill. And lo and behold, they decided or they found out that Tyreek Hill wasn't going to get suspended at all. It wasn't going to be in any kind of trouble. And oh, now you got another weapon. So they kind of lucked into that situation. But McCole Hardman is a guy that not only is he a really good wide receiver, he's a guy that is a special team ace. He's a guy who can flip the field for you quick, fast, and in a hurry. If you uh, kick the ball off to him, he's a guy you got a game plan for because he will take the ball back. And uh, during their playoff run, one of his plays, it was a 54, I, I believe, yard uh, kick return, really kind of changed the game for uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Texans. And, you know, it kind of really jump-started their whole offensive approach. But he's a guy who can get down the field so quickly and so smoothly that – you know, while you're worried about Travis Kelsey, while you're worried about Tyreek Hill, while you're worried about Sammy Watkins, while you're worried about, you know, Damian Williams out of the backfield, all of a sudden, McCole Hardman sitting in the end zone get, catching a touchdown pass. So that's probably a guy, since he's so young, he's only going to be a second-year guy. I'm probably the guy I'd give the love to. I love that. I mean, it's such a luxury to have that guy, you know, be whatever option he is on that offense. I mean, just ridiculous how many weapons they've had there. But as far as a young guy, you have to love what they've seen from him after only one year, especially with, you know, some decisions they have to make in free agency and as far as bringing guys back. But I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to go with an older guy that I know is definitely near and dear to Cody Work. And I'm going a little off the board because I'm going with Derek Wolf. I just love the way that Derek Wolf plays the game. And whether it's the production or not, but he is always a vocal leader. He has had, you know, shouting matches with Philip Rivers. He'll tell somebody he's going to eat their babies. And I know that seems like a weird thing to love, <laughs> but when you're talking about a ferocious defensive lineman and a guy who's going to energize your defense and just that sort of toughness that he brings to them, especially on the interior of the defensive line, which is something the Chargers have lacked in recent years. I absolutely love Derek Wolf. I've always loved the way that he's prepared. I've always loved the way he's gone about his game. And the fact that he can, you know, be a trash talker, but every single guy on that defense, Cody, knows he's going out there to kill someone on every play and he's going to give it his absolute 100%. So I've always had a huge respect from him for him from afar. I'm glad you brought up the whole, you know, uh, telling Philip Rivers, I will eat your children. That uh, definitely, <laughs> I know that's something that garnered a lot. That was just one of those things that came out of nowhere. And everybody was like, well, did he really say that to him? And and so those guys are always jawing at each other. Uh, you know, for me, if I looked at it, I mean, I wish I could choose a coach. If I were to choose a coach, I I tell you what, I, I love John Gruden. I mean, my favorite play is Spider 2 Y Banana. I mean, this guy, he's on the open post route. And yeah, I mean, that's the, my little impersonation there of John Gruden. I love John Gruden. Um, I'd choose him. But if I had to look at a player that I really respect and admire that I feel like is a difference maker. I mean, there's players all across the board, as, as Q had mentioned, uh, Patrick Mahomes. He's a very special talent. But for me, I'm going to go with the the Charters. And defensively, I absolutely love watching Derwin James play football. Uh, he reminds me a lot of a shoulder uh, hitman and shoulder pads. And the way that he reads, David, he's smart. He's the smartest football player on the field when it comes to the Chargers defense. And uh, I, I think that the NFL missed out on him. I mean, his rookie season, I felt like he was a defensive player of the year candidate. I really felt 
NFL. He had a strong chance at that. Um, obviously, I felt like he was an offensive defensive player of the year as well. Um, he's a tremendous talent. I think his future is very bright. And unfortunately, the Broncos are going to have to go against him two times per year for a long time. Uh, but definitely a lot of respect when it comes to Derwin James and the Los Angeles Chargers. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that you guys are also our Valentines. And we really appreciate you guys all week long. It's been our ultimate AFC West division crossover. You've heard from Lockdown Broncos, Lockdown Chiefs, Lockdown Raiders, Lockdown Chargers all week long here. And we're going to be coming back in June for another Lockdown AFC West crossover because the free agency period will happen. The NFL draft would have already happened. And we have a different idea about where our team is headed going into the 2020 season. So you guys can expect another AFC West division crossover show coming up your way here in June. Thank you guys so much. We want to know what you guys thought all week long about the crossover show. Did you love it? Uh, what was something that you wish we would have touched on a little bit more fire away your replies and comment on the shows once we post them on the social media sphere but ladies and gentlemen i'm cody work host of lockdown broncos speaking for daniel wade host of the lockdown chargers podcast speaking for your boy q host of the lockdown raiders podcast and obviously a shout out to ryan tracy host of lockdown chiefs we appreciate you guys and we will see you on monday for another episode of your respective show here on the lockdown nfl network that's it for today's portion of the ultimate afc west crossover we'll have tons more for you tomorrow going over every team in this division with a wrap-up on Friday that will culminate in all of it coming together. Thanks for listening today. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Ryan Tracy is the founder of Rogue Analytics and the host of RGR Football on YouTube. Follow him there. Chris Clark is a senior analyst at ChiefsDigest.com where you can get his work. Rate and review at Apple Podcasts and subscribe.